And, and uh, the mum of the child was a bit funny about us holding a blade to the nine-year-old's throat for some reason. Uh, I've always wanted to tell uh, a short film uh, horror story told in slow motion because uh, I thought it would be really cool if you could um, just about to see something that was terrible that was going to happen to the characters but you didn't know how they were going to get out of it. But I couldn't get hold of uh, a slow motion camera for a long time and slow motion film was too expensive and then I found a slow motion cameraman in Manchester where I live. Uh, I decided to write the story where you could see that there were going to be dreadful things happening um, and it was just uh, after I'd read a quote by a neuroscientist who said that when you're about to die you pretty much see things in slow motion because your brain goes into hyperdrive and you start to process information faster so I thought it would be a great way to tell a slow motion horror film of dreadful things about to happen. Everything was filmed on one of the most expensive cameras in the world at the moment, the Phantom gold slow motion camera um, but what we did is because a lot of the film has knives in it is we had the actors holding um, handles only uh, because they were threatening children in it and the, the mum of the child was a bit funny about us holding a blade to the nine-year-old's throat for some reason um, so on the day we just filmed them holding handles and in my innocence I thought that it would be an easy computer job to do to put a, uh, a blade on to all these knives because I presume that a blade is a 2D object moving in 2D space, but of course that's nonsense. Blades move in the light and they're 3D objects, so it's very difficult to, uh, it's one of the most difficult things in the film to, to composite on all these blades. Um, and a lot of it was done with, a, with an iPhone and a desperate last minute attempt to get some kind of footage of, of, of knives. So I had a call from the American Film Festival that did complain that it was an acceptably pornographic at the beginning because you could see a woman's butt crack. Uh, so, so asked me to cut uh, 12 frames of her ass crack out, even though they had absolutely no problem with knives in eyes and knives against children's throats and blood. Uh, the moment that you show a woman's bottom, that's uh, unacceptable. But uh, the Europeans have loved it because they've kind of got the, a terrorism metaphor, which they've they've, they've embraced. The Americans love it because they they see it as a, a good example of the genre. Um, so I'm just really really happy that different countries have it's found a it's found a market in different countries. Especially as it isn't a, a splatter gore film, yeah. it's much easier to uh, to get an internet audience and a YouTube audience for something splatter. This is a bit more thoughtful, maybe. There's absolutely no money in short films. There's no profit in short films. Um, there's a little bit of interest now that there's content uh, buyers and they'll pay you a little bit of money for them. Uh, but really, they're just adverts for you as as a director. Um, so it is very difficult to make something with cinematic ambitions. Uh, in this country we kind of encourage our directors just to make kitchen sink films and I'm into sci-fi and horror and genre stuff so it's very difficult to uh, afford to make uh, genre short films. Nobody wants to put the money there. For instance Endless was made for £800 which is a hundredth minute per minute the budget of EastEnders and you're trying to make something which hopefully looks better than EastEnders. People, you can't hand films over with excuses as well. Audiences don't accept, oh, this was only made for a few hundred pounds. They, they view everything the same. They view the new Transformers movie in the same way that they move. They view a commercial in the same way that they view a short film. So you've got to make something that looks quite slick with no excuses for absolutely no money. It's very difficult in this country to have the money, to have the commissioners that are brave enough to make pure genre stuff that doesn't have to pander to um, to the tea time crowd, to the EastEnders crowd as well, which is disappointing because some of the best talent and money is in television, but we haven't channeled it into genre yet. But when, when Russell brought Doctor Who back, um, it isn't a criticism, but it was it was very much for a family audience, for a tea for time audience, and for a soap uh, audience as well, that it wouldn't be threatening to them. Whereas the Americans are making genre stuff which, which does play to a niche market, if you can. Uh, so they separate out, separate out their market. This incarnation of 3D is, is doomed simply because nobody wants to eat their tea uh, in the living room with a hundred pound glasses on and, uh, and not be able to see their, their spoon. Look down from the TV, they need to take that off and then put it back on again and all the kids kind of losing their glasses and it costs a hundred quid. So it feels like an interim, interim technology for the viewer it feels too cumbersome and uh, expensive uh, and for the filmmaker it feels really really cumbersome. Every time I walk onto a TV set everything looks 60s and old-fashioned and cumbersome, uh, the lights are really heavy, everything's cabled up, 
uh, the cameras are still really heavy. And that's fine, that's, that's the equipment that's made Lance of Arabia and E.T. and uh, Schindler's List brilliant. But it doesn't feel like the future. Uh, and ironically, what we're moving into is James Cameron's, uh, what he calls the volume, which is the massive studio, it's got a billion cameras in and you put dots on axes, and it's all green, and then you, you fill in the gaps later. Um, that's brilliant if you're a genius like James Cameron, or if you're, you know, Peter Jackson, Steven Spielberg, and you can flesh out a world like that. But for the rest of us, mere mortals, it's it still feels as cumbersome to film in a massive green screen room and to have to imagine an entire world. What you really want is something that's that's like the iPhone. Um, it's amazing how telephone technology has advanced. So you've got a, a camera and wireless and all this memory packed into a tiny little object. Whereas you walk onto a TV or movie set and everything's still 60s and cumbersome and heavy. So I went in the Sony Center asking them about 3D. I wanted to invest, before I wrote it off, I wanted to investigate all forms of 3D, how it works in the cinema, how you can take it home with you. Um, and the manager there saw that I was serious and gave me a long spiel about it and showed me all the kind of movies that you can buy. And then I really innocently asked him about porn because porn has driven every new technology. It's driven the printing presses, uh, Victorian photographs, sort of secret photographs of, of nudes. Um, the VHS boom was, was driven by porn, and then the internet was driven and funded by porn. Um, so it's inevitable that 3D, if it is going to have a takeoff, will, will be taken off by porn. And he, he got very, very angry with me. He told me to leave the store. He was furious. Um, it was it was an innocent question. I wasn't asking whether he <laughs> was into porn or whether he was going to sell porn, Sony related porn in the Sony Center. But he was he was serious. Um, I do believe he's he's missing out on a massive market.